I bet you've experienced it. You've at least seen it. As you grow and as you develop, you face opposition. When you change, even if it's for the better, you end up losing relationships. I was just reading a book called Mind Shift by a guy named Erwin McManus. He's a pastor, and he talks about how as you break through these ceilings of growth, maybe it's like a, a spiritual ceiling. You know, you meet Jesus and everything just changes. Or maybe it's like an addiction ceiling, and you, you break through that and you, and you get sober. Or maybe it's a business ceiling. You experience some significant growth within your business or a promotion, and you're adding staff. As you break through these ceilings, you lose some relationships, People who are with you don't like that you're changing. They, they don't like that you're following Jesus now. They miss the old you. They don't like that you don't party like that anymore. They don't like that you're experiencing success and influence. There's a little bit of envy stirring. Anytime you grow and break through a ceiling, it always costs you. Growth invites opposition. This is true spiritually. This is true personally. This is true professionally. Like to really go after the life that God has called you to live there's going to be some hardship, some opposition, and some suffering. Welcome to the bridge. We're just so encouraging around here, aren't we? It's true, though. It is true. And fascinatingly enough, it was very true of the early church. And what the early church did teaches us how to navigate those waters. I love this. Grab a Bible. We're in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is page 911 in the Bibles and the chairs. Otherwise, in a lot of people, it's their phones or tablets. You have the bridge app. But Acts chapter four is where we're at. We've been in this series called The Story of Us, looking at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is one long narrative really about the story of the church. It's our, it's our family history, so to speak. And so we've been taking it chapter by chapter. In a little bit, actually, we're gonna slow it down and hit uh, a chapter within a few weeks um, just because we got some, some crazy stuff coming up. Love Acts chapter four, though. Excited to jump into this with you. Let me pray. We'll get into it. God, we do thank you for your word. This is your word that we hold in our hands. And may you remind us of the weight of these words. Life-changing, life-giving, your word is living and active. Father, I ask that during this time we humble ourselves and submit to what you have to say to us through these words. May we not fight off conviction, but may we be completely open to what you have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the lens of Scripture zooms into Acts chapter 4, we find ourselves in Jerusalem, specifically the Temple Mount, a guard post, more specifically, built into the northern wall of the Temple Mount. We open an old creaking wooden door and find a bunkhouse where temple guards can catch some much-needed sleep between shifts. One yawns as he grabs his cloak off the wall hook and clears his throat as he wraps his sash belt around him. It's hard to sleep in here. It's not home, but also sharing a room with five other guys doesn't make for the best of sleep. He rubs his eyes, trying to mentally prepare for the day. He's just not quite sure what to expect. See, the temple courtyard has seen more activity here in the last three months than maybe ever and so who knows what today will bring? Suddenly there's a knock at the old thick wooden door and he again clears his throat and he answers it. The messenger, catching his breath, summons him quickly to the courtyard. See, the well-known beggar that everybody knows was just healed. And once again, people are crowding around. He rolls his eyes, jogs to the commotion. He pushes through the crowd toward the steps. And this is where Luke brings us in, verse one of chapter four. It says, and as they... This is meaning Peter and John, Peter and John, and also the beggar that was just healed. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, this is where we can get really confused as we read scripture, because right away we meet three different groups and we have no idea who they are. So then we get a few more verses into the chapter and then we're just all confused. So let me quickly introduce you to these three groups here in verse one. The priests here in verse one facilitate the temple worship. And you probably could have guessed that. Even if the Bible isn't your thing, it's like, yeah, can guess that priest work, priest work in the temple. The captain of the guard in verse one, that's the, um, that, or the, the captain of the temple, that's the guard. They were in charge of crowd control. Previously, they had tried to arrest Jesus, but they were unsuccessful. And they were the security on the temple mount, if you will. Then there's a weird name here in verse one called the Sadducees. The Sadducees are a group that does not believe in the resurrection. 
and not just like Jesus' resurrection, they don't believe in life after death. Imagine that, religious group, no afterlife. Sounds like a really boring religious group, but that's just what they believe, no afterlife. Uh, and, and Bible college, my professors would help me remember uh, who the Sadducees are by saying, the Sadducees don't believe in the afterlife. That is why they are sad, you see. The, har, 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 har. But it's a really good way to remember who the Sadducees were. So, so of course, the Sadducees, they really hate the, the crowd in the Temple Mount that's starting to follow Jesus because Jesus is somebody who rose from the dead. Well, that really gets rid of their worldview and then ascended to heaven. That really kills their whole worldview. So the Sadducees are trying to put a kibosh on all of this. They grab security and they grab the priest. And that's where we, we come back in. Verse three says, and they arrested, they arrested them, meaning Peter and John, put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. But men, and look at verse four, many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of men came to about 5,000. So if you add in women and kids, we're well past 10,000 people. We talk about rapid, crazy growth. It was just a little while ago, it was 120 of them. That's a major ceiling of growth that the church has just broken through. And a breakthrough like that, you're talking tens, over 10,000 people in Jerusalem, that shakes the very foundations of the city itself. And when there's growth like that, you can bet the enemy takes notice and actually gives us our first point. Number one in your notes, expect opposition. Expect opposition. Winston Churchill said, you have any enemies? Good, it means you're doing something. When I was in youth group, I had a youth leader, super good guy, I mean, legit guy. But I remember one time we were talking about um, just some hardship and, and he had said, well, if, if God is wanting this, then he will remove all obstacles. It's like, sounds really nice, but where is that in scripture? Because any heroes in scripture face massive obstacles. That, that was like, that was their story. That was their life. God called Moses to battle Pharaoh and then walk through a desert with, with a whole nation that complained the whole time. John the Baptist was beheaded. Most of the disciples were murdered. Paul spent much of his ministry in prison before then being murdered. Like to really reach where God is calling you, meaning to bring light to darkness, that's living a story of opposition. Obedience often leads to opposition. Paul told Timothy that all who live a godly life will be persecuted. All who live a godly life will be persecuted. They will be opposed. Leading to where God has called you to lead, leading your home, leading a holy life, you will be opposed. It means you're doing something. Like if there's never any opposition in your life, are we really taking every opportunity that God has called us to? Expect opposition. Now, let me clarify this for just a second because some people, and of course, nobody ever in this room, of course not, but some people will look at this and they'll think, yeah, I've got opposition. My in-laws and I, we got beef. Uh, my boss opposes me. My kids don't wanna be around me. It's like, okay, well, you don't have opposition. You, you might just be a jerk and hard to deal with. That, that might be part of the problem. And so it's very easy to do this. When, when, we're, when we're difficult to deal with or maybe we're annoying about politics and people start distancing themselves from us, we can then victimize ourselves. We'll chalk it up to opposition. I'm just out here speaking the truth. I'm persecuted over here. It's like, no, probably not. Could be that you're just suffering consequences of being opinionated, stubborn, and hard to be around. Like we have to keep in mind, it was just a couple of chapters ago that Luke writes the early church had favor with all people. So the early church, they were people who were just easy to get along with. They were blessings to people around them. Notice, this is a big deal. Notice the opposition for the church starts when the church starts doing things in the name of Jesus. That's when the opposition starts. In fact, we're gonna see in a little bit, Peter and John, when they go to trial, their first question they're asked is, whose name are you doing this in? Opposition comes when we further the name of Jesus. It's fascinating because the same is true today with, with our church. If you think about it with the, with the bridge, uh, we, do, uh, we do a food pantry. We never get any flack for doing a food pantry or feeding people. We never get any flack or opposition for fixing people's cars or hosting breakfasts for hurting single moms. We never get any opposition for raising money for clean water or sending kids to, in poverty to school. We, we, we don't get opposition for sending a team down to Honduras as we just prayed for. The bridge, just like the early church in Acts and any other church, gets opposition when we spread the name of Jesus Christ. That is, when biblical, that, that is the biblical opposition that believers are called to face. 
And so when we talk about like opposition in the workplace or opposition with family, we might be thinking, well, I don't know, Junior, I don't really have any. We get along great in my office. We get along just fine at, you know, in, in, with the in-laws. That's great, and I hope that that continues. But it should cause us to question, am I really spreading the name of Jesus Christ? Am I really bringing light into darkness? Because that's historically when there's pushback and opposition. And that's the opposition that we're talking about here in Acts chapter four. So let's get back to, to the story. If you're anything like me, I'm a, I'm a very visual person. So like maps really help me understand what's going on. Pictures really help me understand the, like the flow of the story. And so l- let's come back into the story, but come back here with, with this picture uh, as we just shown. Uh, last week, we saw that the beggar at the beautiful gate was healed and that would have happened right here. So that's where the beggar was, was healed. This stirs up the crowd. You think about it. Like we just saw a guy Ever since we were kids, lying at this gate, begging for money. We've seen him, he was, he was there for 40 years, every day, and now he's walking around the Temple Mount. So we're very curious, crowd gathers up, there's a big commotion. And it would have started at this gate right here. Well, Peter walks over to the steps of Solomon's porch with a newly healed beggar. And the beggar stands next to Peter and Peter preaches to the crowd. That would have happened right over here at Solomon's porch. It would have been steps leading up to this little like pavilion. So the confrontation here in verses one through three would have taken place on these steps right here. The temple guard arrests Peter and John. They take him into custody. They spend the night locked up, a night of little sleep, a night of a lot of nerves. Early in the morning, security then takes them likely to a room in the temple called the Chamber of Hewn Stone, which would have been this room right here. That's where the Sanhedrin meets. That's where like the big wigs within Judaism would have met. And that's where Luke brings us into this story. Verse five says, on the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. By the way, this is the room that they would have looked as they are gathered up. This is the room of, rough, room of uh, hewn stone would have looked like. So this is... as. Luke is naming some names here. That would have been some of these names of these guys standing around. Now, you have to understand, this would have been so intimidating. Put yourself in the room for just a second. The shadows from the lit torches accentuate the rough hewn stone wall. 70 seats face you. Each of those faces are a celebrity and they're not known for mercy. They hold your life in their hands. Just weeks ago, they sentenced your rabbi to death. Their facial expressions are as cold as the stone floor. Their questions are direct. You're tired from being up all night. Your empty stomach churns, triggering feelings of nausea. It's hard to think clearly right now. And you try to keep your legs from shaking and your voice from cracking. And this is when they ask, by what power or by what name did you do this? In other words, what are your credentials? That's a good first punch. Because remember, each of these faces that stare at them, each of these faces are highly educated people. They were top of their class throughout school. They were formally trained by well-known rabbis. They were the pride of their towns. When these guys walk through a marketplace, people turn and people whisper. People take notice. Hey, you know what that is, right? Peter and John stand there. Two former fishermen from nowhere, country bumpkins. They're not top of their class from the bottom of the class trained by a rabbi who was executed. So this is a good first punch. Why don't you tell us your your credentials? What gives you the power to stir up the Temple Mount? What name are you pushing? Most would cave in this moment. Most would backpedal. Most would shrink back. But someone greater than each of these faces resides in Peter and John, and they won't back down. Verse eight says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, notice that, there's Sadducees, by him this man is standing before you all. I can't help but think the first part of this answer came from Jesus directly. It was just a couple of years ago, Jesus was being questioned by the religious leaders for healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, uh, is it wrong to do a good deed on Sabbath? Here, Peter's just repeating what his rabbi taught him. I mean, you can see how Jesus really developed Peter. And Peter finishes by, you want the name? 
You wanna know the name? The name is Jesus Christ is the name that we do this. The one you sentenced to death. But then you said, you did what you said nobody could do. Resurrected. That's the name. But you could heard a pin drop in that stone room. But then Peter's not done. Verse 11, it says this. Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. It's one of my favorite, favorite parts of scripture. Verse 11 here, Peter is quoting from Psalm 118. But there's some often missed beauty in this. See, it's it's likely, and this is not well known, though it should be, but it's likely that the crucifixion of Jesus happened in an old rock quarry in Jerusalem. This rock quarry in Jerusalem was used to uh, to mine stone for the temple. So that rough hewn stone room that they all sit in in that moment, those stones came from that rock quarry. Rocks that weren't adequate for the temple were littered all throughout the quarry. After the temple was finished, the quarry became a place of execution. Attach that psalm to what Peter's saying here. This is mind blowing. In a rock quarry full of temple rejected rocks, there hangs the man on the cross whom the temple also rejected. Yet he has become the cornerstone, the most prized stone, the foundation of our faith happened in a quarry of rejected rocks. As they stand in a room full of accepted stone, Peter can't help but point out the stone you rejected, that's the name he stands. It's incredible, isn't it? Verse 12, he continues on. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. Talk about a moment to have been there. The start of the meeting, those 70 faces, they held the power. This is their meeting. This is their interrogation. The Holy Spirit, through Peter, flips that dynamic. This room has never felt this before. Speechless. Feelings of powerlessness. And I love verse 13. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that these were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. This is so encouraging. They recognized they had been with Jesus because they were just common men full of weakness. It was through their weakness, their lack of education and their commonness that God's power shone through them. It reminds me of one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about how you and I, we are clay pots. Fragile, cracked, broken, clay pots. And often we feel this in our bodies, right? As, as we get older. I don't know if you've been maybe getting up from the couch lately. You know, just clay pots. We are very fragile and we're breaking and we're, we're aging. But God is our treasure. So 2 Corinthians 4 talks about treasures and jars of clay. It's so poetic. Cracked pottery. We're broken people, but there's treasure in these skin and bones. There's God in us. And that treasure glimmers and shines out the cracks of the broken jar. This is why God uses broken people, because his glory is displayed in our weakness. It's through the cracks of our facade that God's glory shines through. It's why God loves using broken people who know they are broken. You ever feel broken? Good. This is who God uses the most. And we're seeing it here. I love that. It's like, we could tell you've been with Jesus because you're common men, but, but you have power. Well, the next three verses, the high council meets, they kind of feel like their hands are tied. I mean, the guy's healed, so we can't punish people for healing a guy. But they also don't want this to get out of hand. I mean, the, the church is growing too fast. It's threatening their agenda. And so they, they put a deal on the table. Verse 18 is the deal. So they call them back in and charge them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. So, all right. In other words, here's, here's the deal on the table, guys. Chill out. Truce if you slow down. You can keep growing. You can keep your growth up until this point, but it stops here. No more growth. And we'll just leave you alone. So stop growing. No more opposition. By the way, verse 18 is constantly offered to you every single day, every day. And most people take it. The deal just looks very different. Actually, as a, as a church, we are constantly offered this deal on, in verse 18. Now, periodically, we send out mailers and we invite people to church. I don't know if any of you have ever gotten one of our, our mailers. Maybe you're here because of, because of one of the mailers. We get a lot of people coming in our doors because of the mailer. And we know anytime we send a mailer out, it's a mass mailer, our phones in the office ring off the hook. And not from people calling us to encourage us, hey, we love your mailer. None of that. No, like people are ticked. How dare you send me a church mailer? We've had people rip up their mailers and mail them back to us. 
That takes commitment. When we got that, I was like, I've never thought of doing that when a window place sends me a mailer, like just throw it away. But just sending out mailers to invite our community to church incites big opposition. So there's a temptation at a staff level to like, all right, you know what? Let's not do that again. That was a really annoying week of taking all those phone calls and opening up, opening up those letters back to us. Um, so there's that temptation to not progress. Let's not keep rocking the boat. Let's just kind of chill out. It'd be more peaceful for us. All right, so let's just, you know, less hate mail. So let's just chill out. No, we're gonna keep on sending mailers because God asked us to keep taking more ground. Jesus is to the highways and the hedges. So get out there, bring light to the darkness. People are going to hell. I think the church can take a few rude phone calls. But this is the offer on the table in verse 18. You are offered this personally all the time. If you just chill out, you can keep this friend. If you just chill out, you can keep this relationship. I can date this person, I can have more peace if I just compromise. If I don't go to where God is calling me, I can have less pushback and live a more relatively peaceful life. The deal is always on the table. And some of us take that deal every single day. Look what Peter and John do, verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. And I love this, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. Certainly not what the Sanhedrin is expecting to hear. But if you look at these verses, what is the main issue for these disciples, Peter and John? The main issue. It wasn't their safety. That's not what they're thinking. I mean, they're in chains in the moment. It's not their safety. It wasn't their comfort. It wasn't what was easiest. It wasn't, hey, what's gonna be more peaceful for us? The issue for the disciples was what's right. What's right? What is right in this situation? And it seems so simple, but there's so much power here. When we face dilemmas, we face hardship, we tend to overcomplicate things in order to excuse ourselves from doing what is right. In fact, you see this in counseling all the time. Something happens in, in, at work or something happens in your personal life or something happens in the family and we know, okay, I need to step up. I need to do the hard thing. I need to forgive. I need, you know, we need to step up. But we, we, we end up doing is we end up telling ourselves that it's far more complicated. Well, you know, okay, here's the thing. I know that's the right thing, but it's not that simple. You know, it's a complicated situation. The marriage dynamics are just very different, you know, and the work politics and, and there's this and there's that and that plays into it. And we add all of these layers to excuse ourselves from that which we know we need to do. The disciples do not do any of that here. They could have. Well, hey, it's complicated, okay? The politics of the Sanhedrin is, is pretty wild. And, uh, and they're just trying to bring a little bit more peace to the Temple Mount. Also, they feel threatened. And uh, we're putting good church families at risk. It's complicated, so let's just kind of chill out and enjoy the peace for a bit. Peter and John wouldn't even flirt with that idea. No, they just stick simply with what's right here. What's right? To shrink back wouldn't be right. And it's such a simple paradigm, but it's so powerful for our lives. What's the right thing to do in your marriage? What's the right thing to do in this marriage? What's the quickest route? It's not what's the quickest route to happiness. It's what's the right thing to do in this relationship? What's the right thing to do with this business? What's the right thing to do with these finances? What's the right thing to do with this struggle? And the answer is usually far more clear than, than we make it out to be. We just don't wanna pay the price for doing what's right. And I wonder how many of our life's conundrums would be solved if we just went with that rule of thumb. What's the right thing to do here? Even if it cost me, what's right? And you see the disciples leading, leading the charge in that. Verse 21, it says, and when they had further threatened them, so they didn't like the answer, of course. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They walked free. And oh, they walk across those temple stone, cobblestones free. But make no mistake, things are changing. Things will be very different now. And they feel it. There's a target on their heads. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported with the chief priests and the elders what they had said to them. And I love verse 24. Look at verse 24. It says, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. If you highlight or circle in your Bible, circle that, to God. They lifted their voices to God in prayer. Often when we feel opposed or threatened, we lift our voices online. Right? 
emotional post. I just gotta dump all these feelings online. You know, kind of gives you that false sense of doing something. Go march and raise a big fuss and then get upset when other people aren't making as big of a fuss as I am. The early church raised their voices together to the most high. And their prayer is so genuine and heartfelt. You can almost feel their, feel their prayer. It says, this is sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. This isn't some poetic pleasantry, by the way. I mean, this is very poetic and it's beautiful, but the church is actively putting things in perspective here. This is, this is I love this right here. 2000 years ago, this mega church in prayer is teaching us the lesson. What do you do when you're facing opposition? First off, you expect it. But second, put the opposition in perspective. Put it in perspective. When you're facing it, people are taking their shots at you, or maybe you feel outnumbered, it's so easy to feel overwhelmed. It's a bit like a, it's a, bit like a magnifying glass. Remember these? I don't think people use these anymore, these magnifying glasses. Magnifying glasses make things greater so that you can kind of you know, see the details of what you're looking at. This is what we do when we face opposition or hardship is we, we take out our mental we take out our mental magnifying glass and we hold our magnifying glass up to our opposition because we want to see the details of what's going on. Why am I being opposed right now? What, what did they say? And how did they say it? And who did they tell? And who else did they tell? And what's their play here? We magnify the opposition to get all the details. And then we get overwhelmed and all alone because our opposition feels so much greater because we magnify the opposition. The early church puts the magnifying glass on God. We're not gonna stand around and put our magnifying glass up to the Sanhedrin and be like, okay, well, who maybe could we possibly, you know, get in good with? Who's for us? Who's against us? We're not gonna put the magnifying glass up to the Sanhedrin. Instead, we're gonna put our magnifying glass on God. We're gonna magnify God. And when you magnify God, you are overwhelmed by his power, his plan, his might, how close he is. All of a sudden, you don't feel so alone because you're magnifying the right one. When, ma- when facing opposition, you're going to magnify something. Magnify the right one. It's what the early church is doing here. It's fantastic imagery here, isn't it? I love scripture. Verse 29 says, they continue on, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants peace and an easy path that we may tread. It doesn't say that, does it? This is why you should have a Bible to make sure I'm not just making things up. Verse 29 does not say that. They don't ask for an easy route. They don't ask for peace. They don't even ask for protection. Such a common thing for Christians. And I don't know, like maybe you're newer to church or you're just kind of checking things out. Maybe you've never heard this before, but Christians kind of, kind of do this weird thing. And I've been guilty of it before, but like Christians will get together and they'll pray and they'll be like, God, we ask for a hedge of protection. And I've always wondered, when I was a kid, Bible college, and I would hear that, people say that, and I would just repeat it because I didn't, you know, just felt like that was the normal thing to say. But I always wondered, like, what does that mean? Like a hedge, of, like we want God's bushes? Like we want some bushes around us? Like I would rather have an army of angels. I don't need some bushes. I still don't know what it means. But these people here, they don't ask for any bushes or, 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 or peace or an easy path to tread. No, this is what they, they don't pray this. They pray this, grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And it gives us point number three. What do you do when you face opposition? First off, expect it. Put that opposition in perspective and then ask for boldness over ease. This should be our most common prayer. Most common prayer we should pray. God, I ask for boldness. I ask for boldness to do what you've called me to do to further the name of Jesus and to bring light to darkness. See, too often we ask God to lift our obstacles and dissolve our opposition. And there's moments of praying that. King David prayed that. If you're going through the bridge reading program right now, we've been reading that in Psalms, right? God, uh, David asked for that, of course. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But do you ask for boldness to take that step into difficulty? Because personally for me, I feel like sometimes my prayer life demands that I have a better life than those who God used in Scripture. So I'll read Scripture. I'll be so inspired by these guys' lives. Oh, I want to be just like that. And then I go to God and I ask, I demand a better life. Remove all my obstacles today. Just a couple of weeks ago, I, I took a walk. I like to walk and pray and look at prayer walk. And, and as I was praying, I, I found myself asking God, I was like, God, it would just be so nice, Father, if you could, if you could bring a season of, of 
rest? Could I have a season of peace? And it's not necessarily a bad prayer. That's just on my heart. So I'm pouring this out to God. God, can I just have a season of peace for a little bit here? But God's response was funny. A couple hours later, I had a meeting with a strategic partner for our church. And uh, the strategic partner runs a ministry of underground pastors and training underground pastors and sending them out. In fact, our church pays for like half a dozen of their salaries. And so I'm meeting with the CEO. And, and as we're meeting, they asked if I would go and I would meet with some of the underground pastors um, up on the field and do some training with them. And I'd asked, okay, well, where, would, where do you want me to go? And they said, well, the meeting place would be this country that's going through a civil war. It's not a safe place for Christians, but they really need, like, they really need you to come and, and just encourage. And so I said to him, I said, man, I don't know. Civil war? Like the last trip you guys sent me on really kicked my butt. I, I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, Junior, come on, bro. We have just a sliver of time in eternity where we can really suffer like Jesus and for Jesus. Why don't we just taste it now? What do you say to that? <laughs> like, well, let's, we'll talk about it later, right? Let's table that. I, you know, I'll, I'll think about it. The next item on the agenda, our meeting started by talking about one of the guys who we support uh, is, is in the most dangerous area in the world. He was the first Christian that he knows of in his country. And now he's pastoring a church. And many in his church at a church event were arrested. And the very next day they were sentenced to death. And so we were meeting about this pastor. And of course, like I'm trying to figure out, like, can we help him out? Can we smuggle him and his family across the border? What can we do? Trying to get into the details of all that. And the CEO just stops me and he says, hold on a second. You need to listen to this voicemail that I got on my way to this meeting. I got a voicemail from this pastor. And the voicemail said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to the prison of my brothers tomorrow. They arrested my brothers because they want me. He said, if you see a male, he's a man who lives around lions. He said, if you see, if you want a male lion, you go for the lioness and you go for the cubs, the male lion will show up. They're just trying to get me. So I'm going to the jail. And he said, he finished his voicemail and said, whether I die or by miracle live, may God grant me the boldness to continue where he has called me to. Here's a man facing more opposition than I could ever imagine, literally walking to his death. And through that man's boldness and by miracle of God, we still don't understand it, he walked away with his brothers. Like that had never happened. I'm listening to this voicemail and I'm thinking, I just got done praying to God for a little breather for my cushy life. I walked away from that meeting feeling like I heard from God. And in a way, God was saying, like, what do you want a breather for, Junior? Come on, press on. Ask me for some boldness. You don't need more ease, you need boldness. And so often I don't aim to live a life that requires me to go to God and say, God, I need boldness here. Now I know God hasn't called us to walk toward our potential death and to die as martyrs and we shouldn't feel guilty for, for that. That's not our calling, we shouldn't feel guilty about that. However, sometimes we will think, you know, hear stories of, like that, of this. And we'll think, okay, well, I would die for Jesus. That's great, and I believe you. But are you living for him? Like you're, you're willing to suffer in the big ways, but what about all the little small ways that he calls you to every day? Are you suffering through purity as you date? Are you suffering as you do things the way that he's called you to do them? Are you suffering by forgiving those who hurt you? Like, yeah, your, your calling isn't to walk to your death, but your calling is to invite your neighbors to church and to suffer through the rejection of when they say no. Your calling is to season your conversation with family with the hope of Jesus and to be okay with them just disregarding it and thinking less of you. Your calling is to suffer in all the little small ways. Are you doing that? Each day is a call to die to yourself to fight temptation with all you got, to live holy and to bring light to darkness. And when you do that effectively, when you bring light to darkness, when you do that effectively, you consider it an honor when you catch the attention of hell itself because you're living a life that stifles hell. Hell only really opposes real threats. So let's taste it. That's the calling. So as Jesus followers, we should wake up in the morning and say, bring it on. Opposition is a sign that you're just being effective. 
Yeah, there's hardship, there's pain, there's hell. But regardless of the heat, the gates of hell don't stand a chance. Jesus said that. Gates of hell don't stand a chance. So we press on. And as we press on, we magnify the one who on a cross fought the fight in a rock quarry and finished the fight in an empty tomb. And we live from that victory. And we press forward and we press into that suffering. And we consider it an honor when we face that opposition. And so we ask ourselves, so what? As we always do, coming out of God's word, I mean, this is such a good narrative. Peter's preaching here and his reference to the rock quarry as they stand in the, the stone room. I mean, it's just such a great narrative. But how does this change our week this week? How does this change our calendar? How does this change our relationships? And we're gonna go into a time of corporate reflection as we always do. It's a time between you and God, time for some confession. Also a time for commitment to be like, God, I, I know you press this into my heart, this conviction. Okay, I'm committing to this and we need this time. The question I wanna toss your way to really guide this time of reflection is, is where do you need to add boldness in your life? Where is God convicting you? Where do you need to be more bold? Maybe it's within the opportunities that God has given you in, in your career and the faces that you come across. Just to have that boldness to care about their eternity and to not be weird about it, but to look for those opportunities to bring light into their dark worlds. It might be a neighbor, it might be friends, parents at school. Where do you need to add boldness in your life? Father, may we be a people who need boldness. May we live lives, the lives that you've called us to live following Jesus. May we live boldly. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, this is your time of reflection between you and God. I'll close this out in just a second. I'll take this time. Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we not forget this conviction, those names, those faces that have come to mind, those situations that you've called us to. And Father, may we follow Jesus. May we not take the deal on the table that we saw in Acts 4.18 to shrink back. But may we continue to follow Jesus even when the heat gets turned up. And we thank you for the faithfulness of the disciples and the the example of the early church that's set for us. May we be like the early church. May we magnify you and see you for who you are. You are great. You are mighty. You are good. You are here. You are close. You are our Father. And may that truth put any opposition in the right perspective. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.